Christopher, you are excited. You said by this corner, especially. Yes, so this fabulous painting from 1952. Yes. Really a landmark painting from my father. When he painted on this scale, it means he had something especially important to say. Uh, and it's been extremely well cared for in uh, a private collection for many, many years. But I had never seen it, and it had not been shown publicly in several decades. So one priority for me was to create a retrospective that would be compelling for France, but would be filled with paintings that Europeans have never seen. Uh, so this painting, I can almost promise that no one who comes to this museum will have seen. Mm. And then its close uh, neighbor uh, in the next corner is from the uh, art gallery at the University of Arizona, so mm -hmm. it's in the far west of America, uh, given to them by uh, a private collector many years ago. I, th I think it is truly one of my father's great paintings from the uh, middle 1950s. <clears throat> It does not reproduce well, so I have not seen this painting in ah. multiple decades. It doesn't and reproduce it does well. Know, it ends up looking black on top and white, which is so mysterious. It's a whole another universe to enter. It just becomes flat in reproduction. This is why you need to come see Rothko in person. Ah, that's for sure. It, uh, it only comes really to life when you are in front of it. And uh, so you try to find the unknown? Of Rothko? Yes. Uh, I, that was I, your responsibility for the exhibition? It, it, I, I gave this responsibility to myself. I said I've been involved with many retrospectives in Europe over the last uh, 25 years, uh, and many of them have been quite beautiful and quite successful. But I also know that uh, the majority of those works came from the National Gallery in Washington or the family collections. And I was not bring, interested in bringing all these same paintings again. I wanted to do something that would really Unique. give people a fresh sense of Rothko. But uh, let's go back in front of this incredible, beautiful painting. Anyway, you are, it's an achievement, one can say. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly very proud that I was able to um, secure really very generous loans from yes. uh, places that for a long time had resisted. Um, and. Uh, it, it, for me, even though I failed more than I succeeded, uh, you know, it only takes one success for it to be magical. And this painting uh, is everything I'd hoped it would be. I would, I'd seen reproductions, but you never know if the reproduction lies But before or not. that, you never saw it I've in never person? I never saw it in person. Wow. And I only, I only went on faith. Wow. So the, the owners might must be a bit sad without this painting in their everyday life now. Uh, I, I, I hope that they will come to Paris and be happy that it has good company. Exactly, very good company. So, uh, speaking about the family collection, your collection, in fact, so one of the first paintings in the exhibition is a self-portrait yes. with glasses like of a blind man. Yes. <laughs> so, what, what, what did you happen to think since your childhood about this kind of surrealist painting, a painter who could be a blind man? So my, my father, I think through much of his career, his, there is always a, a movement forward and a pull back. He shows you himself and then he says, but don't look at me. <laughs> look at my painting. Oh, but my painting is full of me. And, and really, I think the breakthrough of the 1950s uh, really what we think of as his classic painting is he's finally willing to put all of himself into his painting and and just speak very directly to the viewer. I think there was always a reticence before this and we see this expressed in the self-portrait. It's his only self-portrait and he is certainly um, thinking about Rembrandt when he is doing this. He loves Rembrandt, his favorite painter, certainly one of his favorite painters. Um, and he gives himself the same stance, it's in the same colors, but instead of having Rembrandt's ever so expressive eyes, we have him covering. So look at me, don't look at me. Look at the painting, don't look at me. <laughs> ah, but when you were a kid, wasn't it a big interrogation, this painting? Uh, how, how do you the, fact, the fact that uh, the, blind man, the blind man was a painter. I, I did not know this painting as ah, a child. Okay. No, we, we had no paintings uh, from the time I was seven until the time I was uh, almost 20, really almost nothing, uh, nothing to hang. So wow. we are very fortunate. And when I say we, I mean my sister uh, Kate and me because we do everything together. But yes. uh, for many, many years because of uh, terrible uh, uh, lawsuits, uh, we had no paintings. 
and we are very grateful that uh, not only is our, do we have a collection of Rothko, but uh, we have fabulous exhibits now because we were able to get the paintings back. The foundation for the, Roth, uh, the Rothko Foundation got their paintings back. They gifted these to public collections, so there is much more Rothko in public than otherwise there would have been. When we spoke last time, we spoke about the, uh, your father was in Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, he studied Talmud when he was a kid. Yes. And uh, don't you think this uh, taste for abstraction, even, even if he doesn't call it abstraction, uh, uh, the fact that he was Jewish uh, had an influence of this, uh, this idea of abstraction? What I, what I don't believe, I don't believe that he would not paint the figure because this is prohibited. No. I, but that I don't believe. A but, culture. But I do believe the idea of uh, a deity that we cannot look at, an idea, a deity we don't, even, we don't even know his name, right? We're always searching for this, uh, uh, really this unknown. Yes, I think he's, that's, he's on a similar journey, right? So his paintings show us something, something we can imagine, something that's true in ourselves but we have to complete, it's a journey for us. And it's a little bit like the, yes, like the Jewish religion there. Uh, there are not a lot of answers, there are more questions. Yes, exactly. So it could have had an influence, you think, the, the studies uh, of Talmud uh, when he was young? Perhaps, he was, he was very young. He stopped this study when he was probably nine, or nine years old. But you know that most of the big feelings begin when we are very young. Right? I, I do know that I'm a psychologist and yes. I lost my father at, uh, and my mother at six. So, and yet I know, and yet I know them. So um, yes, I, I understand that uh, important things happened then. But I also know from people who followed similar courses of uh, education that the young children are not introduced to the most sophisticated ideas. Mm. But of course, there's something, the core ideas are there. Exactly. And you spoke about his American identity and that he was not feeling completely comfortable about being American. Could you speak about that? Uh, he, he said that he never felt completely at home in America. It's a very commercialized culture. I think it's a very pragmatic culture. Mm. Uh, he was not a pragmatic man. He was a man who believed you know, in, 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 in ideas and, in, um, <clears throat> and in, um, in beauty and things that, uh, you know, are not necessarily the first priorities in America. Uh, that said, I think being in America gave him a lot of freedom to reinvent himself, to reinvent his artwork multiple times and to find an audience that maybe he would not have found in a more traditional culture. Oh, that for sure. It was the right place to be after the war, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, also, when it also the right place to be during the war, especially if you're Jewish. So yeah, but when he when he was at Yale, they stopped giving him the a scholarship because right. he was Jewish. That's right. Yale had a, and it was not only Yale; it was all the important universities in the U.S. But they had a very, um, they had a, a long history of excluding people, particularly Jews at that at that time. Later on, they exclude other people. But, uh, um, and of course they exclude uh, black people and Native American people all from the beginning. But they had a long history of um, moments of being more open and then closing it off again. So he had a scholarship, a full scholarship. He had no, his family had no money. Uh, but after one year that was taken away mm -hmm. and he struggled to work and be in school the second year and then it was too much. And he was very disappointed by university anyway. He thought this would be a great, um, a great academy of, of, of serious people, uh, you know, learning uh, the great historical works and very serious about their studies. And uh, in fact, he found that it was mostly uh, rich people there to have a good time. Mm -mm. And uh, it's got it's gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. No. <laughs> no, I didn't say perfect. Better. <laughs> and and uh, what about uh, what what does the other? paintings that you are very proud about them being here? Uh, you, you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, just, uh, just one. Just, just, just in this gallery? Yes, for example. Um, for example, um, I would say this uh, small greenish painting, or small, it's uh, by comparison small, the greenish painting in the yes. center here. Uh, this is from a foundation in Los Angeles, the Weissman Foundation, which, which you can visit. You have to, you know, you have to make an appointment. You can I know, I went there. So, but 
Okay. So, so, wind, so widow is alive. Yes, yes. And they were they were very um, forward thinking. They have an amazing collection of 20th century art, uh, and um, they purchased this a long time ago. Uh, but although you can see it, it is not something that the general public knows. And again, uh, I I was. Um, Insist with, insistent with them quite early in this process, asking them to loan it because I love this painting and I know that most people don't know it and I thought that it's, it's um, a, a very gentle painting. It's a very uh, quiet, subtle painting and it's one of those where you spend a little bit of time and it, uh, it just warms your soul. So I'm so, so, we so happy. We need that in this oh, period. We, yes, we do. <laughs> a lot. Yes. It May seems like it gets more like this every, every week now. Yes, that's terrible. But this painting really gives some strength, I yeah, think. Absolutely. And go deep into ourselves, no? Absolutely. And this is, this is one of these where you can never, you can never quite know what color it is because um, the, the colors are painted, the paint is so thin on here, the colors from underneath keep coming through. So one minute it's green and the next minute it's yellow and then there's this pink that peeks out. Yes, this band, but also comes through the yellow band below it. Um, you know, he, uh, and he was very mysterious about, no, not that he was hiding, but he wa when he was painting, he was alone. It was, yes, it was a solitary journey for him. It was really his own existential journey. And then he invites you to take the same journey with him. It's a beautiful journey. Thank you. Thank you. Merci.